Welcome to section 1.5, Bias in Sampling. So sometimes, no matter how careful we are about choosing our sample and doing our, the correct type of observational study, sometimes the results of the sample are not representative of the population. Then our sample has bias. And we're going to go over the different types of bias in section 1.5. The first types are um, the three we see here, sampling bias, non-response bias, and response bias. So let's go through these one by one. So sampling bias is when the sample, whoops, it's, all right, so when the sample does not represent the population. And that happens um, when our samples aren't random. Remember we like random samples because it's more likely to get a sample that looks like the population. So a sampling bias, um, another word for that is like a convenient sample. So if we have a bad sampling method, then we have sampling bias. The data we get from that sample isn't going to represent the population because the sample doesn't represent the population. All right, the next type of bias we can experience is non-response bias. And that happens when we have a sample, but the in individuals may not participate in our study. So a non-response bias is when individuals don't respond to our surveys. Individual does not respond to survey. And that missing individual is needed so our sample looks like the population. So when we start removing individuals due to non-response, now our sample doesn't look like the population. So our data is not going to represent the population. Okay, so this happens a lot, like um, if you go to Target at the end of the receipt, they always say, participate in our survey. And the only way they can get people to participate in the survey is they say there's a drawing for like a $500 gift card. So what that is is an incentive. So to counteract non-response bias, often whoever's doing the survey will offer an incentive. to increase the response rates. So offer incentives, and that can helpfully counteract the non-response bias. Finally, we have response bias. So response bias happens when we have a good sample. Um, the individuals are participating, but for some reason, they give the data that is false for whatever reason. So response bias, individuals participate in the survey and give the data, but the data is false. So individuals participate in the survey, and give data, but the data is false. And that one's more complicated, so we're going to focus a lot on the response bias. We're going to focus on how the data is false, or why the data is false. And there you go. Okay, so um, notice these types of bias happen um, in the sampling process, right? Either it's a bad sample, it's uh, sample bias, the individuals don't participate, or when they do participate, the information they give is false. So this is called a non-sampling error, and that's our next vocabulary term. So a non-sampling error 
is an example of these three right here. So sampling bias, non-response bias, response bias are all non-sampling errors. So a sampling error, this is an error. A sampling error is an error that almost always happens no matter how careful we are. So it's an error that happens whenever we use a sample. Whenever we use a sample, that is to estimate a parameter. Remember where, what a parameter is? A parameter is a numerical measure of the population. So parameter is from the population. Okay, so we know um, like if we had a good sample and let's say we wanted to find the average height of El Camino students and we sampled correctly and everyone told the truth about how tall they were. Um, if we took a different sample, we're going to get a different average height no matter what. And that's because of the sampling error. A sample only kind of gives us a ballpark of what the parameter is, no matter how good the sample is. So that's what the sampling error is. Naturally, the, the statistic, the sample statistic, will hardly or rarely ever be exactly what the parameter is. So that's our sampling error. Okay. But we're going to focus on the non-sampling error, response bias, because it's a little bit more complicated than just either having a convenient sample or people not responding to a survey. So let's see how the data can be false. So first of all, we can have interviewer error. So that's the first type of response bias, interviewer error. So this happens when the interviewer has a vested interest in the data. Um, or if they're just a bad interviewer, maybe the individual doesn't feel comfortable giving correct data to the interviewer, maybe they are intimidating, something like that. Um, so this could be something like uh, when the interviewer has a vested interest in the data, like if Colgate wants to know what the best toothpaste is, and Colgate said, we did this survey, and people say Colgate's the best. Well, they obviously have a vested interest in the data. All right, so that's going to be one type of response bias is interviewer error. Another type is misrepresented answers. And essentially, like let's say I asked everyone how tall they were. I say I'm 5'10", but really I'm 5'9 and 3 quarters. Most of the time when people are asked how tall they are, they kind of round up a bit. And that's a misrepresented answer. So people tend to either exaggerate or even undersell their abilities. Okay, but when they do that, now the data is false. So it's a bias. The next is words used in a survey. So words can be very powerful. Some words are more powerful or biased than others. So um, let's consider these two questions. So first, do you think we should forbid refugees from entering the country? Versus this, do you think we should allow refugees to enter the country? So they're both asking essentially the same thing, um, but which one is the strong word? Forbid. So maybe because that word is so strong, it's a little bit um, harder to agree with forbid. So if we had a survey, if we said, yes, we should forbid, that's the same as saying, do you think we should allow? That's the same as saying no to this question. Um, but what do you think has a higher percentage? So the yes, because it's hard to agree with the word forbid, we would see that maybe like 13% would agree with forbid versus do you think we should allow refugees to enter the country? Well, that's a little bit, you know, less powerful than forbid. So even though it's the same opinion, because it's easier to agree with not allow, we would actually see like a 20% on that one. Um, but the, the percentages should be the same. So the words used in a survey question, now our data is incorrect because of the wording of the question. Okay. 
Another thing we'll see a lot, and we see this in the um, like elections when you go to vote for like a president or vice president, or excuse me, when you go to vote for president, they'll switch the order of the presidents because sometimes the first one we see is the first one we vote for, especially for undecided. So order of questions or, or words, um, it could lead to bias because people tend to maybe just always pick the first one or maybe we just like the number three, so we always pick the third one. So they switch up the order of words or questions to avoid this type of bias. Okay, so um, for instance, we can also switch not only the order of the words, sometimes we can actually change the words. So for instance, maybe on one survey, the question would be, do you approve of the POTUS, President of the United States? Or, and then on another survey, it would say, do you disapprove of the President of the United States? All right, so um, there's that type of bias. We also have the type of question we can have an open-ended question where the individual writes the response and we can have a closed-ended question that's like a multiple choice so you can choose from a list of answers. These can create bias because open-ended for instance um, if I asked you know what's your favorite type of music there are so many different genres of music right it could very well possible that all um, 35 students in my class would write a different genre of music. And so now, if I have a list of 35 and they're all different, that data is useless. I can't make any conclusions based on that. So open-ended, sometimes we can have so many responses that the data is useless. Versus close-ended, let's say I ask the same thing, um, what's your favorite type of music? And I said A, classical, B, country, C, other chances are everyone's going to choose C other. And now my data, again, is useless. So the type of question can produce bias as well. Um, sometimes to avoid that, sometimes we'll start with an open-ended question to see what kind of answers are out there. And then we'll see if we can make any sort of categorical um, classifications. And then we can create close-ended. Finally, the last type of um, bias is data entry error. If you got an 80% on an exam and I put your score as an 8%, well, now that data doesn't match what's actually going on. So that's bias. So um, data entry error, humor error, human error is actually a type of bias. All right. So let's, let's do this. Um, again, I invite you to push pause. You're going to look at the different type, these different scenarios, and you're going to determine the bias. Before you push pause, I just, I, a mistake is to read the question and then to make assumptions about the scenario. When determining the type of bias, just read the situation. All right, don't assume something happens after or don't start thinking about what could happen. The bias is directly in what we're reading. All right, so let's push pause and see how you do. All right, welcome back. So here we have that an anti-gun advocate wants to estimate the percentage of people who favor stricter gun laws. He conducts a survey and asks, do you favor harsher penalties for individuals who sell guns? So I would say this is definitely a response bias. And there's two different types. Response, pardon my S. Two different types of response bias right here. One is wording in a question. Harsher is a strong word, right? Harsher penalties at that. So um, we can definitely say wording of a question. Also, if the interviewer is a anti, whoops, anti-gun advocate, then he definitely has a vested interest in the results. So we can also say interviewer error. So wording of the question and interviewer error. So to fix it, suggest a remedy either reword the question or get someone neutral to interview. All right, number two, your local grocery store mails out a survey uh, to 1,023 customers, see what the customers think of their store. Out of that many, 12 respond. Definitely non-response bias there. Uh, suggest a remedy, offer incentives, offer incentives. 
All right, now the village of Oakland wishes to conduct a study regarding the income level of households within the village. The village manager selects 10 homes in the southwest corner and sends an interviewer to the homes to determine the household income. Well, of this village, maybe the southwest corner is the nicest corner. It has the biggest home, so that kind of seems like a convenient sample. So that's going to be sampling bias. Um, whoops, sampling bias. Okay. And then here next we have that a health teacher wishes to research on the weight of college students. She obtains the weights for all the students in her 9 a.m. class by looking at their driver's license. All right, so a couple things going on. If she's looking at all college students, well, college students take classes at all times during the day. So first I would say there's a little bit of sampling bias going on. A little bit of a convenient sample, yes. And then look at your driver's license. Is that what your weight is currently? No. A little bit of a response bias as well. Um, even when we go to the DMV, do they have a scale at the DMV? No, you tell them how much you weigh. And sometimes people exaggerate or undersell their abilities, right? They kind of shave a few pounds off their actual weight. So we definitely have some response bias. So the health teacher could look at students um, from all different times of the day, from all different classes, and she could actually have a scale to weigh the college students. Finally, suppose you're conducting a survey regarding illicit drug use among teenagers in a school district. You obtain a cluster sample of 12 schools within the district and sample all sophomore students in randomly selected schools. The survey is administered by teachers. All right, well, I don't know too many sophomores that are going to tell their teachers they use illicit drugs, so we definitely have some response bias with interviewer error. And then um, we could even argue since they had a good cluster sample, that's legitimate, but just sophomore students, that's not necessarily representative of teenagers in a school district. So we could even argue that it's a little bit of a sampling error as well. Okay, so a nice solution would be to um, randomly select from all levels, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and to have the survey be administered by someone other than the teachers.